Welcome back everybody. This is Eric and Ray here and we're here at Moss today. We've got a very special video for you here. We're going to be doing a video called the 45 Confusion. Uh, if you guys haven't seen them, check out some of the previous videos that we've done. We did one called the 22 Confusion, the 30 Cal Confusion, where we discuss all of the different Parrot cartridges that go along with 22, 30 bore. Uh, we've done one on 9mm. Now we're going to talk about the old famed 45 bore you know, and the bore diameter of 45 and some of the confusion that comes along with it. Uh, there are some projectile differences, there's some cartridge differences. Uh, there's certainly some things to discuss and some things that you should probably know going into it. Uh, 45, definitely. yeah, 45 is an old school cartridge. You know, the mm. 1911 is a powerhouse of a pistol. Um, it's served a lot of folks really well over the years. It's an old cartridge, been around a long time. 45 ACP is probably where, when people think 45, they think 45, 45 ACP. 45 auto, definitely. For and, sure. You know, it's got this um, bit of aura around it as being a great knockdown caliber, and it can be. There's no doubt about it. It certainly will put you on your butt faster than a ball 9 millimeter if you're shooting ball ammo side by side. So, yeah, there's definitely some, um, some good stuff about the larger bullets. Yeah, they all fall to the 45 ball. That's the old saying. That's it. Okay, you know, and there, there's, there's definitely nothing wrong with 45 ball going down range and messing things up. There's a lot of confusion out there about 45 as a caliber and 45 in general as a measurement when it comes to uh, guns. You know, we've got a lot of different cartridges here. We're going to kind of go down the line and discuss some of them uh, briefly. Um, we're going to go down the line here. We've, we've already talked about 45 ACP. Um, this is some Lehigh Defense uh, ammunition, yeah, which is stuff. some crazy stuff yeah, going on yeah, here. That it is. So this is sort of taking uh, our concept of talking about old school 45 ACP, taking it to the next level with some of these modern carry uh, loads. Yes. Uh, modern carry, uh, modern propellants and modern projectile designs have really allowed the 45 ACP to remain a mainstay and just to be an awesome caliber even now. Uh, here we got some 45 gap. All right, there's a big difference already. So you have the Glock automatic pistol or gap. Yep. And essentially with gap, it's basically a small primer. It is. Okay, which is was one thing to consider, and it's also a shortened case. It's shortened at a few millimeters, so the reason they did that is so that Glock could fit that into their smaller frames. You get a grip size the same as a 19 or 23, yet you're shooting a 45 caliber projectile. I thought also there's probably a lot of vanity that went on with that. Mr. Glock probably wanted something with his moniker on it, so why not make the 45 gap? Yeah. Something simple enough to do. They already had most of the tooling. Is it popular? No. It's pretty much dead. It's kind of gone um, by the wayside. Chad really likes it. He's got a whole bunch of that stuff. He likes weird stuff anyway, though. That's his problem. Well, Chad, Chad got on the, the 45 Gap bandwagon. He did. And he wound up buying a Model 38. And that's getting in. We, we need to do a video called the Glock Confusion and talk about oh, the Glock right. model number because <clears throat> that'll, that'll get you really mixed up quickly. Will. But the Glock 38 and 45 Gap is a pistol that he has. I, and seriously, I can't make this up. They, I can't make it up. That I, you know, the, the numbering system for Glock is just kind of consecutive and they go along as they make them and they add the numbers to the gun for the model designation. But it keeps getting confusing. So you got a 38 that's a 45. You've got a 40 that's a 10 millimeter. You got a 45 that's, that's a, a 9, nine millimeter. millimeter. So I almost wonder well, if they do, they do that on purpose. I don't know. All Maybe. right, we're going we're gonna to keep moving on here. Maybe. but. That's, a, that's another story for yes. another time, boys and girls. Definitely. All right, so here we got another old school 45. Now, outside of the wheelhouse, probably even older than 45 HCP is our 455 Webley. The Webley is. It's actually a bit older because it was done in the uh, early Mark series of Webley break open revolvers. The bore diameter has changed a bit over the years because they called it all kinds of different things 476, I think, and 455. and. Ended up being pretty much the same as 45 ACP. The Brits have always done things a little bit weird with their Whitworth measurements, which are not imperial and they're not metric. They're Whitworth. They're British. You know, odd enough. So that's about as close as it gets to 45 ACP diameter. The energy on that is pretty anemic. The conical bullets were not good stoppers. Better than the 38 Webleys, but Definitely yeah. not better than the 455 Ely Ball in the semi-autos or the 445 ACP. But just a neat piece of history. 
the Brits used it to great effect during the wars, and they were issued very widely. But 45 caliber it is, but it's not the same as anything else. Yeah, and, and you'll wind up seeing a lot of 455 Webley revolvers that have had the cylinder shaved to accept uh, 45 ACP, mm -hmm. uh, you know, have them modified to shoot 45 ACP, and that's mainly just ammunition availability, just to make, you know, so you don't have to source the oddball ammunition. Uh, this is a box of old school Fiocchi, 262 grain lead nose, very, very anemic. Um, the 455 Webley is a cool, old school, classic 45. And guys, speaking of 45s and old school guns, there are so many old school 45 bore guns out there, and there's some that are even intermediate. So you can do some research. There's tons of cool stuff out there, but this is an old school 45 that's even older than the 45 ACP we see in the 1911. All right, so moving down the line, we're running into 45 Colt. Now this is some Winchester PDX-1 Defender ammunition. This is a modern version of the 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 45 Colt. Yep. Um, this is definitely getting into some some higher pressures and better bullet designs, better propellant. But you know, as a cartridge, 45 Colt in some circles might seem a little anemic uh, compared to some of the other butt stomping things we have out there. But yeah. a lot of potential cool though in today's modern revolvers. The um, interesting part about 45 Colt is the fact that bullet diameters have changed over the years as to what has become pretty commonly 45 caliber in the 452 to 454 diameter, depending on the manufacturer, but mostly 454. Right. It started out as 457. Some bores have gone down as low as 452. 451 even. 451. So 45 ACP is 451, 452, depending on the manufacturer. 451.5. Five. If you're <laughs> Sierra, they do the weirdness there. I don't know. They meet in the middle, so to speak. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just real, real weird the way they do it. But um, yeah, the 45 Colt is an awesome caliber. It just gives the whole gamut of power from real basic lead cowboy loads up to better than 44 Magnum ballistics if you've got a revolver or a lever gun that can handle it or something else that can handle the pressure. Sure. Oh yeah. Yeah, so That's all the way down from anemic up to butt stomping and the, the, the 45 Colt utilizes 454 diameter projectiles? Pretty much. Okay. Yep. So getting into 454, we're going to step up our game a little bit and get into the, and I'm checking just to make sure I grab the right one. This is 454 Casul. Now you're talking essentially 454 Casul, and this is just sort of my take on it. You let mm -hmm. me know if I'm if I'm wrong here, but 454 Casul is to 45 Colt as 44 Magnum is to 44 Special. Like it's kind of a hot rodded 45 Colt. Pretty much, yeah. 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 Dick Casul wanted something that was just interchangeable with the 45 Colt as far as being able to shoot Colts in the gun if he wanted something softer and just off the shelf, but wanted something just awesome as far as power goes. Why not stick with the 45 as one of the most popular calibers in the world, in the United States especially. So just make it bigger and better. That's what he did. That's all we do here in the United States, make it bigger and better, right? That's right. More powder, yeah. you know, so, bigger, heavier bullets maybe, you know, getting into some more pow uh, powder in there, getting more velocity, mm -hmm. more energy downrange. You know, 45 bore bullets, and we're going to get into some rifle cartridges here in a moment. But they have the ballistics of a marshmallow. They, they tend to have, you know, really poor BCs. They fall out of the air like crazy. They have very elliptical trajectories. And, but they maintain a lot of carrying energy at extended ranges. And we're going to talk about that a little bit as we get into 4570 here in a moment. And we're going to talk about the different 4570s as well. Absolutely. So, all right, we're going to go down the line here. This is 460 Smith & Wesson Magnum. So again, this is taking the concept of, all right, we're not quite at 4570 in a revolver because that would be stupid, even though Magnum done. Research makes a 4570 oh, revolver. Yeah. Other people have done it. The old gunsmiths back in the days would take two Colt single action armies, cut them in half, braze two cylinders together, braze two frames together to make a 4570 revolver. Yeah, crazy enough as it was, all black powder stuff, so the guns usually didn't come apart. There you go. So if you're crazy enough to do it right and pull the trigger on it enough, it's probably real interesting, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. You know, the 460 Magnum is a butt stomping cartridge. Um, you're getting into entry level 4570 territory. You're getting some power out of this cartridge. 
So you're way, way above the territory you're going to be in with 454 Casul. You can obviously see, comparing the two, a lot more powder going down range, you know, a lot more velocity. Uh, you're getting very similar bullet weights, but simply more is better, right? More is gooder. Exactly. And taking, you know, I used to have a 460 VXR Smith & Wesson revolver. I think it was one of the ones that had the either 12 or 13 inch barrel. You know, one of the big one boys ones, yeah. and 460. That was nice. And man, it puts holes in things. It's just crazy. Yep. So you get into the 460, and that's definitely a Magnum class handgun caliber that still launches a 45 uh, pill. Yeah, this just gets into a handgun that's huge, though. It's not a particularly portable unit. You almost need a uh, travel or something like that to drag behind you to carry the thing. Well, having a lever uh, rifle in that caliber would be yes, something to behold. That would be awesome. Uh, I know Bighorn and a few of those types of companies, um, if I'm thinking right, yeah, the big the Bighorns, uh, they make like, a, I believe, a 500 Magnum 500 lever gun. Magnum, and I don't know if sure they do if a they 460, 460 though. But they could probably do it yeah. if they don't. That would be a heck of a lever gun cartridge there. Oh, a lot of power going down Lots range. Lots of versatility there, too. Kind of a, a fine line, especially as you start to get into a rifle, which has a little bit more weight. The 460 would do really well on a rifle because you're not getting into the heavier recoil energy of some of the, the top end 4570 loads, but you're not getting into something a little bit anemic. Like, I mean, some people may not want a lever action in 45 Colt if they are not happy with the power. Getting up into something like that gets you into kind of that middle range between 4570 and then like 454 Casul and everything. One of the nice things about the 460 is you can shoot the 454 and the 45 Colt. A couple others you can shoot too that are pretty obsolete, like the 45. Um, uh, what's that shorter one I'm thinking about? There's. Um, Never mind, I'm not thinking about the right one. I was thinking about the Russian stuff in 44. There's Sorry. so many cartridges out A lot of confusion. <laughs> even, even we get confused occasionally. That's so. right. It's, um, it's a nice cartridge, though. It gives you some versatility. So we're going we're gonna to go into a couple of more modern 45 cartridges. Um, and we're going to talk about it a little bit. And we're also going to talk a little bit about bullet diameters because it can get a little bit confusing. So, you know, Very. with the 45 ACP, you can get into 451, 452 territory. Here we got into 454, 454 mm -hmm. Casul, and then you start getting into a diameter we call 458, which is what we would pretty much consider for our uh, 4570s, 458 SOCOMs, but not for 450 Bushmaster. So there's some confusion. The yes. 450 Bushmaster still uses a 452 diameter projectile, does not use a 458. Mm -hmm. So you're getting some reasonably good power in a relatively short action. Uh, mm -hmm. This Bushmaster cartridge, and uh, they they developed this for a short AR, AR platform. platforms, definitely okay. AR platforms, and the um, so we've got something else here, the 458 SOCOM, which is also specifically designed, I believe, by Tromex, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. At some point, I think they did that Don't for quote me on that. <laughs> for the AR platform, and it uses a um, it uses all kinds of different projectiles in 458, so you can pick a lot of different bullets. You can, and your nominal mm -hmm. bullet weights on your 458 SOCOMs are gonna be around All the 300 over. grain range. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Getting into 300, uh, maybe some heavies getting into subsonic if you wish. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also go lighter on the projectiles. The twist rates on the 458 SOCOMs are really, really flexible for a wide variety of different bullet weights. Um, the brass life is a little spotty for reloading, probably not gonna get a ton of firings. It is a relatively high pressure cartridge. Um, but I have a CMMG anvil that's chambered in this, and it will absolutely lay down deer and hogs and all kind of medium to even large game. And uh, it is c centered around an AR platform. Definitely. And it's sort of, if you think about it, in a way, it's, it's kind of a bottleneck 4570-ish because you're getting into the same exact projectile you would put in a 4570 or 458 SOCOM, or a yeah. 458 Win Mag. Yeah, you, you can basically get all but the very top end of 4570 ballistics out of an AR. Which is nice, you know, it so is. that's kind of taking that whole 45 bore thing and going into a little bit more modern. You know, you look at like 577, 450 Martini Henry, that gets really confusing because they call it a 450, but the projectile size on that is actually 468, in some cases even fatter to fit, you know, because Martini rifling is, or Henry rifling is kind of odd. Well, it's odd, it's and it's valleys also, and peaks. <laughs> yeah, and it's not the most consistent stuff in the world either, because you had all kinds of different countries making that thing. 
Indians were making all kinds of stuff up in the mountains and hammering things out of water pipes. So <laughs> there's there's tons of different variations there. The um, and again that goes to the point that they're measuring not the bore diameter sometimes, but the groove diameter. So that's another confusing part is some countries measure bore, some measure groove diameter. Mainly it's all bore now across the world, but up until say fairly modern times, you could get measurements bore or groove, and that's another confusing part of the- All right, I mean, when you look at 303 British, it's not 303, it's like Ooh. 318 or 313. Like cast bullets have to be often sized all the way up to a 316 to 318, depending on how fat the bore is. Mm -hmm. And your your projectiles you buy, such as Sierras, are gonna be a, a 312 or a 313 diameter uh, to be able to make up that, that fatness there. You know, it's not a, th a 303. Again, you add that five thou on either side, and bam, you get 313. Yeah. So there's, there's been a lot <laughs> it's of confusing. confusing. Yeah, been a lot of confusing. Even with manufacturers, there's there were times when barrels for 45 Colts were 454 diameter, and the dang cylinder throats were 452. So what are you doing? You're squeezing the bullet down before it even gets to the barrel, and it's wobbling down the bore, and the accuracy is for crap. So <laughs> yeah, they fixed that, but it took them a little while. If your forcing cone is smaller than the bore, what are you doing? You're yeah. forcing the bullet down, and then it's tumbling down the bore. And you're not getting any accuracy. So that's definitely something to consider. All right, now we're going to discuss the 4570. Now this has almost a confusing aura all in itself. Okay. Most definitely. Mainly because rifles were built for so long for this caliber. It was one of our first military rifle cartridges. I mean, as far as metallic cartridge goes. Yeah. Uh, truly, one of the earliest and one of the most popular. So this was built for trapdoor spring fields. And those things are not strong. They're not meant to take pressures over about 23,000 PSI. And that's still pushing it. You don't and really it's hard to get that, that out of black powder, really. It really is. I mean, you can do it, but you gotta do something stupid mainly. Yeah. And uh, we try not to do that. So originally it was a black Except powder for a purpose. cartridge. Now, we'll do it on purpose a lot, but we don't do it by accident. So this particular caliber and case, everything about it, Pressures range from the 18,000 PSI range to own up into the 50,000s, depending on the action that the cartridge is going to be put into. So your 4570 trap doors, keep it mild, black powder, equivalent pressures and loadings. And that's what you get out of the boxes for most of the manufacturers today, unless you go to a specialty maker like, say, Buffalo Bore or someone of that nature. And they specifically have it on their box, this is not for certain guns, only for right. certain actions, and they load different levels. So this Federal, this is going to be soft. It's going to be mild and pleasant to shoot in an average gun, unless it's really, really lightweight. Performance-wise, though, back down here to the Kasul, it's only about 1,500 feet per second or less with, say, a 400-grain bullet um, for that equivalent. But with proper powders and a strong action, the gun can be moved up to almost 458 Winchester Magnum ballistics, very close to it. The um, bore diameter has pretty much stayed pretty solid at 457, 458 throughout its whole life. So that's the one thing that has been consistent about nothing else. Yeah, well there you go. You know, yeah. it's, it's a very, very old school cartridge that's been around a good minute. And when you look up reloading data for the 4570, you're gonna definitely see uh, some warnings and caveats that are put into place there. You know, and they actually have a reloading section specifically for the 1895 action. They have a reloading section specifically for the Ruger number one action. The Ruger number one is probably one of the strongest actions for the 4570. You can take Ruger number ones and you can load 4570 to some stupid pressures and it will absolutely hold it if your shoulder can. And you can also uh, stabilize a wide variety of different bullet weights in 4570, which make it a really, really great cartridge for a wide variety of different applications. Absolutely. Uh, 4570 bunks the brush really, really well, pushes through. You can get all the way down to as low as like maybe a 260, 280 grain bullet, mm -hmm. all the way up to around a 600 grain bullet. It'll stabilize them just fine. A lot of your original 4570 from back in the day, in, in the early days of metallic cartridges, paper patch projectiles, so they would paper patch them out to get really good velocities and uh, also to be able to push those cast bullets 
at faster velocities. Paper, uh, gas, paper patching were kind of the first gas checks that we started to see because a paper patch is nothing more than a gas check, not only to provide a tight fit in the bore, to, but to protect the base of the projectile and to provide a nice tight fit to make sure that bullet grabs the lands and grooves and really gets out of there really good. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. You know, with the 4570, there were lots of offshoots from it. There were shorter cartridges for lever guns that couldn't quite fit this in there. There were longer cartridges for bigger actions or single shots. So you'll see 4565, 4590, 45110, 45130. It's, it's just adds to the confusion. And most of those were designating the powder charge that fit in the case for particular guns and particular overall loadings. So that's another part of the confusion when it comes to nomenclature on 45 caliber. That's right. You know, and, and a lot of it also comes down, you look at 4570, a 45 projectile on 70 grains of powder, 4570. So there's even confusion in the naming of a lot of these projectile or a lot of these, these rounds as well. You know, 45-120 would make you assume that there's 120 grains of powder in the cartridge. And that goes back to the old days of when they used to sell basic brass in a lot of cases. So a lot of different gunsmiths out on the frontier and stuff would be able to take a given piece of brass and trim it to whatever the customer's rifle may require. Correct. So what they started to get in the idea of us, well, heck, let's try to make this 4570 more powerful. Instead of cutting the brass down, let's stuff it full of powder and put a bullet on top and punch the chamber out and be able to just get more velocity. Absolutely. They found that there was kind of a threshold there that once you kind of cross a certain point on the powder, we've discussed this in, in previous videos, they just weren't getting a ton of extra power. Power They're just burning up a lot of extra powder. That's yeah. neither here nor there, but to let you know that there's a storied history to the 45 bore and what it's done. Not only, you know, it's the 45 bore as 45 Colt, 4570, 45 ACP, 45 as a diameter, as a bullet size, has probably had, you know, more storied history in American history than anything else. I mean, it is the American bullet diameter. Well, and it got started long before metallic cartridges. The Kentucky Long Rifle was well known for superb accuracy, and a lot of them were 45 caliber. It was one of the most preferred calibers overall for that. Um, even before that, flint locks were done in it. It just tended to be something easy to manufacture, probably because a lot of stock was made in half inch, and it was really easy to cut it down slightly to make your cutters to cut bores to 45 caliber. Sure. You don't have to remove a lot of material stock to make the jerrys for pulling bore um, cutters through. So make a few little minor adjustments to half inch stock and there you are. You got 45 caliber. That's you know, my theory on it. Don't hold I, me to it. I, I can't wrong, help but, but think that, you know, that's a totally feasible theory because you look at the, you know, the 577 450, you look at the Martini Henry cartridge. They experimented with 40 bore martinis that were in a 40 caliber bore. Well, why take away all that meat? I don't know. I, I think they wound up kind of experimenting a bit and kind of going back to the 45 bore in that without getting on a tangent because I, I don't want this to be a much longer video, but I'll just mention quickly that, you know, they had a lot of success with the 45 caliber Whitworth. And yes. I think that they were trying to replicate that a lot in a, in a breech load gun in the Martini, I think is what they really wanted. Um, now, last but not least, we're going to talk about a modern Magnum in the 45 bore that is just so cool. It is. The um, 45 Winchester Magnum, which is this guy right here, we've got it loaded with one of the Lehigh projectiles, which brings it into the modern cartridge class even more so than it already is. But Winchester developed this for African game hunting. Um, bore diameters over there in most states in Africa require that they be 40 caliber or larger before you can hunt big game with it, big five. So Winchester's like, yeah, we want to get on this game. So they said, okay, we're gonna make this in our Model 70, and our particular parameters are 500 grain bullets, 2,000 feet per second, fast enough to kill just about anything that walks, crawls, or flies in the United States or anywhere on Earth. Oh, yeah. They semi-failed at that. They kind of exaggerated velocities in the gun. Um, today's modern powders you can do that with, but then 
be lucky to get 1900, maybe 1850 yeah. out of the powders and the projectiles with the barrel lengths that they wanted. Basically an over glorified 4570. It pretty much was. It kicked harder, um, the higher pressures, and wasn't particularly stable at very high temperatures. The pressures tended to spike because they tended to overload it. To try they were to, trying to get those They were numbers. trying to get those numbers and they just didn't have the powder technology at the time to do it. So Jack Lott decided, hey, best way to do that, make it longer, put more powder in it, more powder and more power, same pressure. So Lott extended the case by like an eighth of an inch, give or take. And if you set them side by side, you can easily see the difference there. And that basically brought the 500 grain bullet up into the 2100 feet per second class, giving all of the energy that you'd ever need. Oh yeah. So oh, yeah. these are two of the most popular 45 calibers for big game worldwide these days. Uh, there's certainly others, uh, 460 Weatherby Magnum, which is another confusion there. It is a 458, <laughs> just with a much bigger case than even the lot here. And, the 460, uh, is it belted? It's belted, yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, all the Weatherby stuff um, pretty much is their Weatherby name brand. They, they do a lot of other calibers Big hunk days. and chunk of lead. Oh, that thing, range. yeah. That thing punches at both ends really good. You start getting into a five, 600 grain bullet uh, moving at, you know, the thing is, something that's big and heavy like that moving slow is nasty. Yeah. You get it moving fast and you add speed and weight into the equation, you get a tremendous amount of downrange power, excellent penetration, good weight retention, really big wound cavities. You know, a lot of these animals that these guys are hunting, you know, overseas with these big heavy bullets moving fast, mm -hmm. they've got to punch through big heavy shoulders, bone, muscle, tissue. I mean, and they've got to do it in a way that, you know, is a humane kill. And they've Pretty also much. got to do it in a way where the animal doesn't kill them. <laughs> right, because those things get angry if you punch a hole in them and it doesn't kill them. Yes. Elephants, buffalo, uh, hippopotamus, those things will bite you in half and one, one, just one bite, you're done. Hippos kill a lot of people over yeah, there. They kill more people. And, and they're mean. They're, they're, they're very they're aggressive. Very if you've ever seen the videos of hippos going after boats and stuff, it's like, oh, hit the gas, man. We've got to go faster. Not like, good. Those things are fast. Yeah, yeah, they are. For their size, the they're agile. Even on land, they're like, they'll, they'll be about as fast as a, as a buffalo. Yeah, I don't know about that. I, I, I'm not sure that's something I want to you know, have a picnic on the side of the river hanging yeah. out. Kind of Mind my own business. Yeah, I'm kind of glad we don't have those around here. <laughs> Alligators are bad enough because they'll sneak up on you around here. Well, well south of here. If but, you ever decide to have a picnic on the side of the river with a hippo nearby, you got your 458 lot. So hopefully this gave you a bit of food for thought, gave you something to think about. You know, maybe. You didn't know some of this stuff existed, now you do. I would strongly recommend that you check out a book uh, called Cartridges of the World. Uh, yeah. it's, it's gone out in multiple different volumes and, and updates been, over the years. Yeah, there's been some edits to it and additions. Yeah. Um, but basically the, the information there is pretty awesome. The books are available from a number of sources. I know Brownells keeps them in their inventory. You can get pretty them from sure them and a few other places online. So. If you're looking for good uh, material just as a reference, that's a great one. It's got all kinds of information. A lot of stuff you probably don't want to know, but yeah. You know, there. honestly, my thing is, I do want to know. I'm the kind of guy, you know, I love oddball guns. I love old school, weird, you know, quirky kind of stuff. So, you know, sometimes going into a situation being more educated, you don't have to know every single cartridge that's ever been. You know, the cartridges of the world will de detail a cartridge that they might only made like 12 guns in it. Yeah, but they will do that. because they put it in there, it, it's just something to know. So you may not have to know every little you know nook and cranny of every obsolete oddball cartridge that they made 12 guns of. However, it'll help you go into a potential purchase decision a little bit you know, armed with knowledge to kind of know if it's something that you want to go down that rabbit hole or not. You know, um, a can lot also, of people get into guns, they don't know, you know. It can also keep you safe from, you know, physical harm. If you're looking at a particular gun and you're not quite sure what the cartridge is, if you've done a little bit of research on the cartridges and the history is in there and it'll tell you about the guns that it was most likely chambered in. So you're saying, oh, okay, I know what that is there. And it's probably this caliber, not that caliber that they've got written on the tag. Exactly. So there are a lot, of, um, a lot of misinformation out there, a lot of mistakes that are made. Uh, not necessarily purposefully, but uh, mistakes. I've seen plenty of mismarked guns at gun shows, even from uh, vendors that have been doing this for a long time. Uh, you know, we're not infallible either. We make mistakes. I'm sure that you'll 
see that from us on occasion, but we're human. Everybody makes mistakes, so we just try to keep it from hurting us. That's right. Yeah, don't, don't be afraid to, you know, do a chamber cast if you're not mm -hmm. sure or if you're not comfortable doing that. Take a gun to a gunsmith, have them do a chamber cast for you. They can take some measurements and determine what exactly you're working with. Um, exactly. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to research. You know, it, it, it is not a problem. You should always try to seek out as much information as you can. Guys, this is not all the 45 boars that are out there. These close. are probably some of the most commonly encountered yes. in the wild. Uh, this is not even close to being all of them. Guys, we hope that you enjoyed today's video. Maybe we gave you some food for thought. You learned something. Maybe you've seen something you've never seen before. And that was the goal of today's video, was to expose you to some different 45s and kind of discuss, you know, why even, you know, Everything is in a name, and, and sometimes it can be a little confusing, but to sort of discuss that for you all. Yeah, and one more 45. If Chad does a good editing job, this will only be 45 minutes long. That's right. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Thanks for watching today's video. Ray, thanks for hanging out in today's no video. Problem. You're a wealth of knowledge. I appreciate it. No uh, guys, you know, we're posting all kind of content. We really, really appreciate the support from all you guys. You're great. Thank you very much for the support. We'll see you next time. Have a good evening.